Welcome to the Church and Culture Podcast, a weekly discussion with Dr. James Emery White on the latest trends happening in culture and where and how the church should respond. Jim is the founding and senior pastor of Mecklenburg Community Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, president of Serious Times, a ministry devoted to exploring the intersection of faith and culture, former professor of theology and culture at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, where he also served as their fourth president, and the author of more than 20 books. I am your host, Alexis Dry, and I can't wait to dive into this week's conversation. Hey everybody, I hope you're having a great week. Now, Christianity Today editor Russell Moore, he wrote an article earlier this year about how increasingly more Gen Z men are having a difficult time launching out into the world independently, you know, whether that's to go to college or into a career or into a marriage or quite frankly, just to get out of their parents' home. And as I mentioned, um, Jim, in a recent episode with you, I really enjoy talking with you about all matters related to Gen Z because you've done such extensive research into their mindset and their values and their struggles and and, and all of the unique contributions that they have to offer their world. In fact, we'll be sure to link in the show notes a book um, that you wrote about them called Meet Generation Z. But um, so all that to say, I really am curious even though I know this might be a lengthy response, um, what do you think is contributing to this failure to launch when it comes to Gen Z men? Yeah, you got to be careful when you answer that because you could just do a whole, you know, analysis of Gen Z itself. Right. But let's start off by being a little bit more clear about specifically what we're talking about when we talk about those and this phrase failure to launch, which is being used a lot right now in our culture and by a lot of different observers with Gen Z. It's a stereotype of the young adult still living in their parents' basement. Sometimes it's called the Peter Pan syndrome. You'll see, hear that as well. Uh, You know, the idea of the young boy never growing up. They don't have jobs, they aren't in relationships, or at least they haven't left their parents' home and created an independent life or a family of their own. Uh, There are a lot of reasons that you'll read that are given for this phenomenon. One is that they live in a technology world and specifically a world of gaming um, uh, that leads to an escapist life and just eats up hours and hours of their day and they just escape and retreat into this world of gaming. Uh, Another is that they're facing a very difficult job market where they can't find work or feel like they can't find work or their college education did not prove to be helpful in finding work or what work they can find doesn't pay enough uh, than they would need, uh, less than what they would need to live on their own. Uh, Some see culture itself as just fostering, you often hear it talked about a slower motion process of growing up, you know, everything's delayed, driver's license and college, and it's just a slower motion kind of process. Uh, Some see the social isolation that came with COVID as playing a role. Another underlying factor is that they they simply lack purpose and direction. It's an interesting thing about this this generation. And from that comes a lack of drive and a lack of ambition. Uh, What they do want, they want it to come easy uh, without effort to just kind of happen and fall into their lap. And many times, obviously, when they're waiting on it to happen, it just doesn't. It just doesn't. Uh, And the thought of going out and creating it and working for it, making it happen because of all the things we've just talked about, whether it's a work environment or time or ambition, whatever, just seems so daunting, so overwhelming, so intimidating, uh, so defeating that they don't even try. It's kind of like the difference between someone who, say, needs to lose 20 pounds of weight and someone who needs to lose 200. Mm. The person who needs to lose 20 they'll see it as an attainable goal that they'll strap on. It's within their reach. Someone who needs to lose 200 is just defeated at the very thought of tackling it. It would be so hard. It would take so long, not just days or weeks, but months to do this. They give up without even trying. It just seems like it's already hopeless. Mm -hmm. So they resign themselves to living uh, the way that they are. And um, so, and while I believe that all of those things are true, okay, all of the above are true. I'm going to go for what I think is the fundamental issue. I think it's deeper Uh, because we're talking specifically about Gen Z men failing to launch. Um, They don't know what it means to be a man. Hmm. I mean, there there, there was an article, and I can't remember whether we talked about this in a previous podcast or not, but if we did, uh, we'll try to find a link to it. But 
there was an article a while back in the Washington Post that was simply titled Men Are Lost. Hmm. And it really stood out to me. And I remember I even did a, it prompted a series for me on on becoming a man and what it means and, and which I try to talk about periodically anyway around Mac, you know, just because I, I feel so strongly about it. But um, let me read you part of that article. It was really interesting and it got a lot of attention. In writing about the men who were interviewed, it was found that they struggled to relate to women. They didn't have enough friends. They lacked long-term goals. Any of this sounding familiar? Mm -hmm. uh, some just quietly disappeared, subsumed into video games and porn, or sucked into the alt-right and the web of misogynistic communities known as the manosphere. So, okay, so stop right there. Those are all the things that people will say, okay, that's what's causing the failure to launch. That's what's causing the failure to launch. But as actually was just descriptive. Mm -hmm. Then it goes on to say, it felt like a widespread identity crisis as if they didn't know how to be a man. Hmm. One doctoral student who was interviewed was told of an undergraduate student asking him what the heck does masculinity look like? And he confessed that he did not have an answer. Growing numbers of working age men um, as a result have detached from the labor market, particularly those between the ages of 25 and 34, uh, men now receive about 74 bachelor's degrees for every 100 awarded to women. Uh, men account for more than 70% of the decline in college enrollment overall. As women have become less dependent on marriage as a means to financial security or even motherhood, they're becoming increasingly selective, which has led to a rise in lonely young men who are single. In fact, more men now live with their parents than they do a romantic partner. Uh, men also account for almost three out of every four what are called deaths of despair, uh, meaning deaths resulting from suicide or substance abuse. Uh, three out of every four of those deaths are men. And it's just it, men are just left reeling about what it means to be a man. Uh, you know, what are men for in our world? What, what, what do men what do men look like? How, how and where do they fit in? And if you find an answer you know, a young man particularly is, how do I know which is the right one? Because there's so many different competing answers. When you do go looking for one, is it the hyper-masculine, hyper-misogynistic views of a social influencer like, I don't know, the former kickboxer and Big Brother contestant Andrew uh, Tate, making it all about sports and women and cigars and sex? Um, is it chivalry? Uh, which is just as confusing to men when they sometimes find out that even holding a door open for a woman can be perceived as sexist to some, uh, do you just throw masculinity away entirely and as if it doesn't exist? Uh, or do you just go with what I, I know we have talked about, or I'm pretty sure we have, which, which is the three B's that tend to define manhood for men. Um, and uh, the first B is billfold, which is judging your manhood by how much money you make or how successful you are with your work or the title you have in front of or behind your name. The second B stands for battlefield, which is measuring yourself on the basis of strength or athletics uh, or physical toughness. And then the third B is bedroom, uh, which is measures your manhood in terms of how popular you are with women. But all of those are just so superficial and they're just so meaningless when it comes to really what it means to be a man. And so when you don't know, wrap up a long answer, when you don't know what it is you're supposed to be, it's very hard to launch out into becoming. Hmm. Thank you for such a comprehensive response. I knew that that's <laughs> what I could count on you for. So thank you. So I just have like a couple of follow-ups. And if you feel like you already talked about these this exhaustively, you can just say pass. But um, I just wonder if there's a little bit more to some of the things that you mentioned. So um, you just talked about how Gen Z men are just not in relationships as much. They have fewer romantic relationships than previous generations. So I want to just ask a follow-up question about that because I even came across an article titled, Are Gen Z Men Really That Undateable? <laughs> so what's going on? Why are they not in romantic relationships? It's interesting. Most sociologists who have studied this uh, have looked at the fact that just sexual activity is down, which would be a result in our modern culture of you know, dating going down. Uh, I read an interview of a sociologist on this, and her take was along the lines of what we we have been talking about. She attributed the slowdown in sexual relations, particularly uh, in what she calls the slow life factor. Young people aren't growing up as fast as they once did. They're delaying the milestones of just getting their driver's license and going to college. Uh, they're living at home with their parents a lot longer. And in times and places where people live longer, 
and education takes longer, the whole developmental trajectory tends to slow down. And for teens and young adults, one place that you're going to notice that is in terms of dating and romantic relationships and sexuality. But I think there's another more, I would say, obvious reason um, about why particularly Gen Z men are not dating as much. They're not as sexually active. They're not as involved in community with women is because they're substituting porn for relationships. I think that just needs to be said. They're substituting porn and studies have backed this up. have shown that young men actually prefer pornography to a real life person, prefer a pornographic sexual relationship or activity than with a real human being. And so um, I think we just need to, to bring that out of the closet and make it known. I mean, that's just, that's one of the things that's happening. Hmm. So why are we not seeing the same failure to launch with females? They're better, wiser, more mature. <laughs> what answer do you have? <laughs> um, Glenn Stanton wrote an interesting article titled, uh, Manhood is Not Natural. Uh, womanhood is, but not manhood. Womanhood, he argued, is a natural phenomenon. Her very biology tends to make her grow into a healthy, mature woman. Let's think about sex. Sex makes babies, but for a man, sex can just be about pleasure. He's not naturally connected to the potential of the act. A woman is. For a woman, it can begin shortly after conception, intensifying daily. It costs her in terms of energy and sleep and comfort long before the pain of childbirth. Stanton writes that she is inescapably invested. The man is not. He doesn't naturally become a mature man the way a woman naturally becomes a mature woman. It's why the phrase is woman up, be a woman, make a woman out of her, don't exist, but they do for men. Uh, so how does a male become a man? It has to be learned. It doesn't happen naturally. As an identity, uh, maleness happens, manhood does not. Uh, and how is it learned from other men? Uh, it comes through a father uh, or father figures and the community's larger fraternity of men. But that's the problem. Either men are being mentored poorly or they're not being mentored at all. Well, you mentioned a little bit already in terms of pornography or perhaps gaming. But I guess if Gen Z men are not launching, what are they doing instead? Well, you know, this is a, this is a good point, a good moment maybe for me to interject something really quick. Um, let's be clear that that a lot of Gen Z men have not only launched, but launched well. Mm. Uh, so let's not lump the entire generation into this. And I don't want to be perceived as saying that I'm painting with this broad stroke. This is the way all Gen Z guys are. No, at Mac, at, for example, around two thirds of our staff fall into Gen Z. Uh, and they are some of the most dedicated, committed, hardworking, kingdom-minded, servant-hearted, make-a-difference people, mature, godly men who are being men that you'll ever meet. Uh, the women, too. I mean, I'm just, I'm just, but we're focusing on men. But among those who haven't, to your question, among those who haven't, the stereotype is that they're living in the basement playing Fortnite. Mm -hmm. um, personally, uh, let me uh, let me tease that out, and maybe I think I can create a few more categories of, and this is observational. Uh, here are the different pursuits that I see them falling into. One is the stereotype, okay, living in the basement playing games. There are a lot of young men living in the basement playing games. I mean, that's just a fact. There's sometimes these stereotypes and caricatures come into being because of their frequency. Another is the unrealistic dreamer, uh, specifically trying to create. And I, what I've seen most is they're trying to create a life, usually as a social media influencer, uh, getting rich and famous, doing little more than posturing, preening, promoting, playing, you know, filming themselves, doing those things. Um, they see a handful of people get a lot of money and live this life of play and frivolity, and that looks good. And now everybody wants to be an influencer. Uh, very few will be. And so, but there is that, uh, what I would call an unrealistic dreamer. Another is the person who's just going, 
uh, from thing to thing, job to job, dream to dream. They work at it a little bit, don't like it, don't want to spend any effort into it. And they just, they're just, you know, you look at their lives, they've got like 18 jobs behind them and with little to show for it. The last group is the one uh, that I also kind of refer to. It's like they're just waiting for something to happen, to just drop in their lap, to come their way. And they're just, they're not doing anything really to make it happen. They're waiting for it to happen. So those are some of the, the things that, you know, you see. Yeah. Now it's understandable, you know, studying Gen Z, why so many social social scientists would want to go to the parents of Gen Z and ask, you know, how much are they to blame for what's going on? So what do you see? And I guess that would be Gen X or older millennials that might contribute to the struggles that are um, that Gen Z men are facing. Very important question. And I'm glad you raised it. You, you can't you can't look at a generation and not look at who raised them and how they were raised. One of the marks of Generation Z is that they are being raised, were raised by and large by Generation X. That's just the fact. A generation that was warned, if you study them, they were warned repeatedly to not become helicopter parents. You know, always hovering over your children. As a result, Generation Z has been given more space, more room, more independence than by, by, by almost any other generation of parents. This has meant that Generation Z has been very self-directed. Translation, you're launching on your own, kiddo. If you're, you know, uh, as one father described his parenting world after ensuring that his six-year-old daughter was on the family iPad, his uh, eight and 11-year-old sons were on the PlayStation, and his two-year-old was watching something on the iPhone, he said, for me, that was a good morning's parenting. Uh, no arguments, and I was able to do what I needed to do in peace. To his thinking, any other type of parenting is not realistic. Why, he said, because the world has just moved on. Since it's not always safe to let children, you know, venture outside where they might run or play or use their imagination, ch children simply have to spend more time in front of a screen. Granted that they could go outside and engage in reading, uh, but such an endeavor invariably involves parental supervision, and that's a limited resource and one that a lot of parents aren't willing to spend. So technology comes to the rescue. It offers parents a way to occupy their children in ways that do not involve direct parental supervision. If millennials were raised by overprotective parents, Gen Z is being raised by, you know, I would argue an underprotective parent, certainly at least in terms of technology. It's as if the one thing you don't want to do as a parent is using the pejorative words of the day, hover, smother, baby, coddle, or shelter. The insinuation is that when it comes to being overprotective, uh, it's wrong to be that, but it's 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 okay to be um, underprotective. If you're going to make a mistake, make a mistake in being loose and playing fast and free and not protecting enough because the one problem with uh, parenting is protecting too much or guiding too much or investing too much or indoctrinating too much. Now, uh, here's where it gets kind of interesting. Having said all that, I'm going to sound something that sounds like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, but these actually hang together, Okay. So you got this underprotective uh, parent, non-helicopter parent, um, while giving that child utter freedom, they also, though, when they do get involved, they get involved by removing all obstacles or adversity. Mm. Um, they may not be hovering, but they're being what's called lawnmower parents. What does a lawnmower parent do? They mow down all of a child's challenges, struggles, and discomforts. That's different than helicopter. Um, the idea has taken hold. I remember reading about this in a viral post from some online community that came out. Um, it was for teachers, school teachers. It, it said that in raising children who have experienced minimal struggles, we're not creating a happier generation of kids. We're creating a generation that has no idea what to do when they actually encounter struggle. Uh, the teacher that authored it uh, shared a story of being called to the office, expecting to retrieve a student's forgotten meal money or maybe an inhaler. Instead, there was a parent there in a suit who was dropping off an expensive water bottle after repeated texts from a child to bring it, even though water fountains were all over the school. And that was actually tame. So there are a lot of lawnmower stories that started to feed this thread. The parent of a high school student who asked a teacher to walk their student to class to assure that the student would not be late. 
a parent who requested someone from the cafeteria to blow on their child's too hot lunch to cool it down. Uh, a parent who called to schedule a makeup test when the student was clearly old enough to request a time on their own. Now, again, this is, this is, this is not about a parent's willingness to help a child succeed. The problem comes from parents' efforts to eliminate any and all struggle so that their children just are not equipped when they grow up and life inevitably throws them, you know, a curveball. I think it's pretty clear how if you add up all that parenting stuff, uh, how that could contribute to a failure to launch. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's shift now to solutions. Um, I mentioned earlier that Russell Moore had written about this. And in his article, he suggests in terms of solutions of, of this is so um, in line with what you were saying earlier, but to look to the Bible to redefine manhood and to cast a vision for young men as to how to truly, and again, the, um, these are your words and his, but how to belong as men. And the, he, I'm quoting him now, but he said, not in terms of self-satisfaction, but in terms of membership, responsibility, sacrifice, and fidelity. What are your thoughts on ways to meet Gen Z where they are, Gen Z guys, and, and guide them forward? First of all, I could not agree more. Just could not agree more. The vision needs to be cast. And I refer to the survey. They don't know how to be a man. Uh, that needs to be cast for what it means to be a man and, and in very specific ways. Like, for example, what does it mean to be a leader? You know, what does it mean to lead a family, to be a family? What does it mean to lead a family to follow Christ and to honor Christ? What, is it, what does it mean to have a vision to uh, help provide for your family or to protect your family or to cherish your wife and children? The, the kinds of things that we're biblically called to do and to be. Vision to just be a man of God uh, and defining your spiritual gifts and put in chasing you know, the way you're going to make a difference with your one and only life as a result of that. Let me, let me just pick one aspect of the vision of being a man to talk about that if that would address so many things in our culture, but it just gives you a taste of how pivotal even just one slice of casting this vision and having that vision be understood and embraced by a man, how much it matters. Just, just the call of a man to protect. Just take that one. You know, in Ephesians, Paul says, love your wives. And just as Christ loved the church and he gave up his life for her. And in the same way, husbands are to love their wives. Our love for our wives is to be you know, like the love Christ showed and to the degree that Christ showed it, which for Jesus involved giving up his life, dying on a cross. Complete and total physical sacrifice for the sake of another. Complete and total physical protection in whatever way would ensure someone else's safety. This used to be the mark of our world. If you insulted a woman in previous eras, you could rest assured you were going to have to deal with a husband. You were going to have to deal with a father. You were going to have to deal with a brother, an uncle, a nephew, or all of the above. <laughs> Literally every man in that woman's life uh, would have been prepared to step up and protect her uh, at any cost. It's what it's just what men did. It's it, you, you understood that that's what men did. Uh, the men in the family would have gone to any and every length to defend the honor of that woman. That wife, that sister, that daughter was under a blanket of protection. The men in her life would not have hesitated one second to lay down their life for hers. Men who understand what it means to be a man still do. I remember when I was in college, I, I, was, I, I went to hear a lecture. I do not remember the man's name. I do not remember what he lectured about. But I remember how it started. He walked out to speak and he had a black eye. And it was clear. I mean, somebody, he'd been in it with somebody or something. And um, the first thing he said was, he said, you're probably wondering, he kind of pointed to, you're probably wondering how I got this. He said, um, I got it defending the honor of my wife. And I would gladly do it again. That was all he said. And that was all I needed to say. Uh, as a Christ follower, you may turn the cheek yourself, but you don't turn it when it comes to defending others, particularly those you have been charged to watch over. Hardwired into who God made men to be or the vision God had for men is protector of women and children, those who are weaker, those who are more vulnerable. And I don't mind saying that. I, I don't think that's a sexist statement at all. It's just being clear about sex itself. God made us naturally larger and stronger and more aggressive, not better, but obviously physically different. And the most obvious difference usually is in the area of size and strength. 
And there's a reason being a man means that you are the one meant to provide security for your wife and family and anyone else who is vulnerable, who needs a man to step up in their defense. But how many men are being men like that today? Uh, and one of the things that I, I, I once spent some time on, and it was so unnerving, I don't want to do it again, is I, I did some research on the social experiments that you can find. I mean, it is fascinating, but it was just disturbing. And uh, that you can find on YouTube where social experiments were conducted. Situational studies involving actors and actresses to see whether or not people would help a woman in trouble. Uh, would a man intervene? Would anyone intervene? And the answer was no, or at least not often. One experiment had a man physically harassing a woman in a public place. Time and again, no one intervened. Only four out of 20 stopped to say or do anything. And if you see the videos on this, it wasn't like mild harassment. I mean, it was clear he was hurting her. Like you may think that people are just hesitant to step into, you know, what they perceive to be a domestic dispute or something, but that if it were something serious like sexual assault or attempted rape, well, then they obviously would. Well, there was another set of social experiments that were done that I saw that involved actors portraying the sounds of a physical assault taking place within the confines of a car on a heavy pedestrian street. It was very clear, very clear. Uh, from the dialogue and the sounds coming from the actors in the car that it was portraying someone who's being raped. Um, Of everyone who walked by, 85% did nothing. Nothing. Only 15% stopped and knocked on the door of the car or tried to get help. And most of that 15% were women. Uh, But this isn't just about physical intervention. Men are called to protect and establish honor in every way needed. Instead of laughing at an off-color joke that was demeaning or disrespectful to a woman, it's being a man who says, hey, that joke wasn't funny and it wasn't appropriate. When a man hears that from another man, he doesn't tend to tell that joke again. Hmm. Instead of laughing at a guy's remark about a part of a woman's anatomy, It's a man saying, I don't appreciate you talking about her that way. That is somebody's daughter. That is somebody's wife. That is somebody's mother. When a man hears that from another man, he doesn't tend to make remarks like that again. Instead of turning a blind eye when you see some guy pat a woman on the butt or brush against her breast, it's a man intervening and saying, don't ever, don't ever touch her that way again. Uh, Translation, there's another man on this watch. And if you do it again, you'll deal with that man. I'm that man. Chances are, next time, he'll think twice. And it's interesting how with even the smallest of things, men can create a ripple effect when they intervene with another man. Because it's almost like it's a tiny dose of vision. And most men are hungry for that vision. They just have never had it. They've only had gone to their most basic basis instincts instead of a a man calling other men, calling them higher up and deeper in. I, I, I do a fair amount of travel. And I'll find myself on a crowded shuttle that is taking people to the rental car or somewhere else around the airport. And, uh, or I'll be on a subway around a city. And I'll see uh, some women on board, um, come on board, and, and all the seats will be taken, which is common. And so they have to stand. It's not uncommon to see maybe one or two of them uh, very advanced in a pregnancy. I've got my own little social experiment going on that I've done for years. I mean, I, I mean, I, w- I would do it anyway, but I'm also always interested in what's going to happen. I mean, I get up and offer my seat instantly. Uh, meanwhile, there were like six other guys around me who weren't even thinking about moving. They were just sitting there. Uh, then when I do it, then they all stand up <laughs> after I've done it to the other women. And they said, oh, well, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You want my seat? You know, and all of a sudden it's this ripple effect. It just kind of spreads. It, 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 this is the kind of thing that men need to start spreading, particularly older men to younger men, for the sake of women on a very small scale to try to prevent the large scale disrespect and dishonor and even violence that is sweeping our nation right now. And for those who feel that chivalry like that is sexist or demeaning to women, I will be happy to take a straw poll to see how many women agree with you on that one versus how many women appreciate a man using his strength and honor to protect and establish honor. But it's not just about men who use their strength for good, as opposed to men who refuse to use their strength for good. It's also, you know, this, this trickles down to, the, to men who use their strength for evil. 
Uh, because if men aren't being men when they are passive, they're also not being men when they become violent and abusive. Which brings up one of the most heinous things that can happen to a man is that he, he not only stops protecting, but he actually becomes the one who is the threat to those he should be protecting. Uh, he becomes the one who abuses. His strength doesn't go toward protecting his family. It's channeled into abusing his family. The stats on this are just so disturbing to me. And I, I you know, there was, um, I once read that the, the, that there's, there's like 10 million people a year who are physically abused by their partner. That's like, there's like, like 20 people a minute are reporting this. Uh, and the vast majority are obviously women uh, who were abused by a husband or boyfriend. Uh, one out of every three women. I'll never forget this stat. One out of every three women. That's one out of every three of all women, okay, have been subject to some form of physical violence by a partner in their lifetime. Uh, that's just stunning to me. Uh, that's not protecting. That is a gross distortion of what it means to be a man. Obviously, you're to protect them, not to prey on them. Okay, I'm off my rip. But I, I but that's a slice of the vision um, of what it means for a man to be a man, to go from maleness to really understanding what it means to be a man and enter into manhood and what it means to launch into being a man. You know, it's like, as I said at the very beginning, how can you launch into something that you don't know what it is you're trying to launch into? And I do think that fundamentally what is plugging these younger men so many times is they really don't have a vision for what it means to be a man and everything else trickles down from that vocation, relationships, drive, ambition, their relationship with God. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the hope too would be that, you know, the church would be such an affirming and safe place for men to, to learn exactly this, you know, the church offers or when it's at its best for sure, you know, so many multi-generational opportunities for young men to, to brush shoulders with older men who can cast this kind of vision or, and I even think as a woman listening to this of, you know, just how encouraged I feel to, you know, be able to brag on, you know, on biblical manhood when you see it and just how, you know, appreciative, um, I don't know, we are and families are and children are when men are assuming those roles. And so, yeah, I, I, I think we always kind of end in thinking about how the church could really make a radical difference here. And, but yeah, I, I, I think in, when it comes to, to Gen Z and these guys and looking for a place and belonging in this vision, I really do hope that the church rises to the occasion and that would be a great podcast young lady <laughs> <laughs> as as the one who guides this um like how does a church reach men yeah how does a church serve men let men be men and track men because the caricature of the church is that it's almost entirely female dominated and um and 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 in a day when when as you just said men desperately need the church men desperately need this vision mm -hmm. and so many churches are, are not connecting with men at all. And, mm -hmm. and that would be a fun conversation because as you know, um, uh, it's a little different here. It is. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll jot it down. I'm sure it'll come all up. Right, all right. But again, thank you, Jim. And thank you guys for listening. And as always, we'll catch you next week.